Hello, everybody. Welcome to my session today. The topic is lessons learned, use of modern JVM languages besides Java. And before I begin with the session, I want to introduce myself shortly. My name is Kai Wehner. I work for Maibon Wolf et al. That's a consulting and software development company in Germany, Munich. And I do a lot of consulting and development, especially in the Java environment. Besides, I write um, some articles for professional journals and do some talks at conferences such as Java One. Okay, if you um, have any feedback about the session, you can contact me via um, email or Twitter or social networks. I appreciate every feedback, also negative one if you don't like anything. So please give me feedback after the session. Um, I'm a, um, this session, I'm not an expert in any of these languages. I didn't create these languages or so, so this is really a report from the user's perspective about using these languages. And I hope you learn a lot from this session today. Okay, now let's start. Um, the first important thing here is I, what I'm talking about here is you see the Java platform. And what I'm talking about is about using different languages at this Java platform. So there's Scala, there's Groovy and many others and all of these are used on the Java platform but are different languages. This is an uh, important difference between the platform and the language of Java. So, and if you look at the .NET platform, which is a competitor to Java platform, um, there it's common to use several different languages. You use C and C Sharp and C++ and now you can also use F Sharp or Scala and other languages. And these developers are used to that. But if you look on the Java platform, usually that is what you do. You use the Java language here. So there's a little problem with the Java language sometimes. So for example, it's not a real object-oriented programming language. You all know about primitives, for example, which are no real objects. It's a static type language, so this is awesome in most use cases, but sometimes it's better to use a dynamic language. Then the syntax of the Java language is really verbose. Um, it's not really suitable for creating domain-specific languages. And um, its parallel programming model is not really easy to use for many use cases. So in the end, it's not all rainbows and unicorns in the land of Java. And though that's a great thing about the Java platform. As you can see here on the bottom, you have the Java virtual machine. And with the Java virtual machine, you can use the bytecode from several different languages, which can be used on native machines code, and you can use it like on Linux and Windows and so on. And for the Java virtual machine, it doesn't matter which language creates this bytecode. So for example, you can use Java bytecode, as probably most of you do, and you can also compile Scala bytecode and use it on the GVM or you can use Groovy bytecode. Though these are all ahead of, com ahead of time compiled, but there are also other options. For example, you can use um, scripting and then this code is interpreted or just in time compiled. For example, Groovy script code. And besides these examples, there are many, many other languages for the Java platform. You can see here the most well-known uh, Java language, uh, languages for the Java platform. There are about 250 more. Um, of course, some are only adductional or so. Um, but you can take a look at this link. It's really interesting how many languages there exist for this platform. And so this today is a little story about escape from the Java language prison and why we sometimes <coughs> use some other languages besides the Java language. So what's the key message of this talk today? There are three key me messages. The first one is Java is still the most important programming platform. And the second is Java is not a new COBOL, which um, I have read sometimes in the past. And the second one, the most important one probably for you is um, modern GVM languages besides Java, not instead of Java, um, create added value. And so if you look at the agenda for this talk today, um, it's separated into two parts. The first part is about the business value of these new languages. When should we maybe use some of these languages instead of the Java language? And the second part is then about lessons learned because of course it's not always good to use these languages. You shouldn't use them always and there are a lot of problems sometimes when you use them. I will talk about this in the second part of the talk.
Okay, so let's begin with the first part, created added value. When maybe you should use some of these new GVM languages instead of Java. And first we start with um, the reduced efforts. Um, this is probably the examples you have often seen. Um, probably all of you know you don't have to write um, constructors and getters and setters with the new languages. And so I have used another example here. For example, um, if you have to create a comparator, as you know in Java you have to um, implement a compare method and write a lot of boilerplate code to do a comparison. And here's just a simple example of Scala how you can do it. And though there are many cases when you can really reduce the lines of code a lot. And the important thing, it has to be readable also. So you can also sometimes write code which you cannot read after more and cannot understand it. So you have really to choose when you have to use the reduced lines of code. But here's a good example where it's really readable. And it used some syntactic sugar of Scala, for example, these underscores here. And uh, the other thing here used are the closures which are probably also in Java 8 available. And a combination of all of these features of the new languages and also the syntactic sugar, which is often not a, a possible in Java because Java has to be backwards compatible. And so it's only available in new modern languages. And this is the result, as you can see here. So often you can reduce the lines of code a lot. Um, an example where we really often use um, some of these new languages is when we have to do processing of XML <coughs> because that's really horrible if you have to use it in Java and there are better alternatives. For example, um, here's just a little example. Um, you have books, um, several books here inside. And if you have to get the title of the second book, if you do it with any Java API, you have to write a lot of code, a lot of boilerplate code just for reading this line. And I have here one example um, how you can do it with Groovy. So it's uh, always just one or two lines to read something like this from XML processing. And so we really, it's a very good example when you want to reduce uh, the lines of code for XML processing. So we have applications where we use um, the modern languages only for XML processing. You don't have to use these languages for all of your classes and the whole application. You can only use it for some parts of your application. And for example, XML processing is really a good choice. So what's the second business value you can add of um, new modern GVM languages? Um, it's increased flexibility. And I have some examples here too. The first one is modularization. Um, I don't mean jigsaw or something like this here. Um, but um, for example, I have here an example of Scala, but it's also for many of the of other of these modern languages. Um, you can structure your code much more flexible. So for example here you can put um, several classes into one file or also several packages and you can structure it uh, as you want. Um, we have used this feature or this flexible flexibility a lot. For example when we are um, working with new APIs, when you want to learn new APIs, um, then it's really much easier to have all in one class just for testing and writing a unit test or so. And then if you really go to production code, you can of course still structure it as you do it with Java in your own classes and so on. But with this, you are really much more flexible. And another example for increased flexibility is scripting. So what you can do, for example, with Groovy or Python or so, um, you can change the behavior of an application dynamically <coughs> at runtime. So you don't have to compile it before ahead. And you can either do it um, via direct execution of these scripts or you can do it via the um, JSR233 scripting for the Java platform and integrate it into your Java code. So again here it is the example, um, you don't always have to use the code for all of your applications. So you can use for example Groovy or Python only where you really need it. And you don't have to write your role application in Python or Groovy because of this. And in some use cases it's much easier to use some of these um, dynamic features instead of um, writing it with Java and a lot of boilerplate code. And this is also um, an example of these dynamic features for increased flexibility is metaprogramming. So I want to explain it to you on one example. I've often used just simple code examples because it's easier to understand than when I tell you a lot of theory about it. So here's one example where I have Java code and this is a class ABC and I have a static factory class for it which returns a new instance of the object and then I can use this object in a main method. So if you have to do this for several different classes, um, it's a lot of boilerplate code again. 
And now I want to show you an example of Groovy, how you can use meta programming and its dynamic features to add some code to already compiled bytecode uh, afterwards. So here's a little bit of Groovy magic. Um, it's just one or two lines of code. Um, you use the feature of a delegate in Groovy. Um, you don't have to understand now how it, it works really, but um, I will show you the result here. With just two lines of code, you can use the dynamic features to add this factory method, which I've implemented in the Java code before in, the, in one class, to add it to every class you want. So in this example, we use the delegate for the object. And because every class here is a um, subclass of object, every class uses this feature now. So as you can see here, these are Java classes and not Groovy classes. And they are, they, to the bytecode, there's added this feature of the factory method. So you can really try it out in a script in uh, one or two minutes um, if you want, and it works. If you add this line, um, then you can add, uh, use these factory methods, no matter how many parameters. And though here you can see a really powerful feature of this metaprogramming by changing the bytecode at runtime. And here I have a um, real world example of where it makes sense. It doesn't make sense everywhere because um, it can also make your code much more complex. But here's a very good example where it does make a lot of sense. And this example is the Finder in Grails. Grails, that is a, a web framework for Groovy. And in Groovy, when you have um, a database with several attributes, um, with SQL attributes, um, for example, ID and name and description and so on, what Grails does for you in your IDE, it creates all of these Finder, meth finder methods for you dynamically. So if you have a um, table, for example, with an ID and a name, all of these um, alternatives for finding data is created and generated for you at runtime by the IDE. You don't have to write it by yourself, you can just call it. And if you add another attribute, for example, description, then this will also be added here dynamically at runtime. And so this is a really powerful feature and you can see here it, a, it makes a lot of sense because it helps you a lot. So Groovy, for example, was a dynamic language, a dynamically typed language. Um, here's another example of Scala. Um, Scala um, uses a replacement because it's a statically typed language, but uh, it offers implicit conversions. So um, there's also, I show you this because there are also powerful features in statically typed languages. And here you can see if you would use it in Java, if you have a 10, uh, an integer, and want to subtract a string, this is not possible. And it throws an exception in Java and also in Scala. But you can use implicits, so implicit conversions. You have to define it once in your code. And here you say, um, uh, defin define a method where you do something with your string. And here you use the string.toInt message. And after you have added this line of code, um, here you can execute your code again and try 10 minus string 3, and it works. So. Um, this is again really powerful, and so you should really use it wisely. Um, I come to the lessons learned later, but uh, here I want to mention it, use it wisely. Sometimes it makes sense to use these powerful features, as you have seen, for example, with the Grails Finder, but often um, it can get into problems with other developers because they don't know what's happening here. Okay, and uh, another feature of increased flexibility, how do you get um, more business value, is the build management. Because on the Java platform, usually you use ANT, which is a really powerful um, build system, which is um, developed in XML. And you use Maven on the other side, which is con convention over configuration. So there you can't, can figure a lot by yourself. So ANT is the powerful one, and Maven is the um, easy one to use. They have both, both their pros and both their cons. And what's really cool, <coughs> Uh, from the build tools is Gradle. <coughs> Gradle is a build system for the, which is building Groovy and uses Groovy. And the great thing here is it uses the power of ANT and it uses the ease of use of Maven. And that's combined in Gradle. So you can still use all of your ANT tasks and you can still use your Maven repositories. So if you do not have to rewrite all of your code, you can use your old code for your build system and write new stuff with Gradle. And besides of this combination, you have further advantages because um, you do not have to code in XML, but you write it in Groovy. So um, it's really easy to start with Gradle. You should really take a look at it. Um, 
we use Gradle in almost all new projects because um, we don't see any disadvantages. It's uh, in the meantime already released as 1.0 release, so it's a stable release, you can get commercial support. And it's really easy to get started with it. So we recommend it for most um, applications in the future. Okay, that was the second business value. The third one is redu reduced complexity. How can we reduce the complexity when using new languages? And uh, one of the good examples here is concurrency. Because um, the current situation, as you probably know, um, the gigahertz, gigahertz race is over and uh, multi-core CPUs are coming. And of course you need um, new development models for this um, to solve your problems. Because when Java was created um, some time ago, 15 years or so, um, this was not a problem so there were no APIs or concepts for it. And the problem with this is that you have shared state. You have different processes and then you have your shared state and have to solve these problems. And if you do it with the thread API, you have uh, problems like deadlocks and race conditions and other uh, thread exceptions. Probably all of you have deemed this a lot. Um, and it's really complex to solve the problems. Also, um, Java 5, 6, 7, and 8 added new uh, APIs to make it easier. So in the meantime, you don't have to use wait and notify or so to um, work with threads, but still it's really, really complex. And so what's the solution? Um, this can be a solution. You buy a lot of these books. These are very, very good books. For example, the left one, Java Concurrency in Practice by Brian Goetz. It explains all your problems about threads and it's, uh, I mean, it, seriously, it's a really awesome book. Um, but it's also too complex. I, um, it's still too complex to realize problems with threads with this book. Um, you have to invest a lot of time to solve your problems. And now if you look at the modern GVM languages, there are, for some use cases, better alternatives. And th these are the two alternatives. You can use um, software transactional memory and you can use actors. I will show an example for both now to explain what's the difference between uh, the thread API which we use until now. And the first one is software transactional memory which is, for example, implicitly supported in Clojure. So you don't have to call any um, additional APIs or add them. Clojure is built within um, software transactional memory. And what does it mean? It's an alternative to log-based synchronization. So internally, Clojure also does use these logs and so on of the thread API, but you don't have to care about it. And this is a very simple example. Um, you create your two accounts, uh, bank accounts, and define a method for um, transferring money, and then you run your code here. So you don't write anything about um, transaction or so, but Clojure assures that only all of this is done. So if you withdraw uh, money from one account, you have to deposit it on another account, and either both of these are working or none of these are working. But you don't have to care about this transaction. This is implicitly supported by the Clojure language. So um, when to use um, software transaction memory, especially, you, especially if you have many reads and only a few writes. Because otherwise, um, when there are transactions and it crashes, then it has to redo it. And of course, if you have a lot of writes, um, the, the performance is not really good. So if you have a lot of reads and um, only a less of writes, then you can use software transaction memory. For example, with closure. And the other example were the actors. Actors isolate um, your mutability. This means in the middle you have your actor and here you have your state. You can still change your state here and your behavior. But you communicate only via messages as you, for example, know it from JMS. You have incoming messages and outgoing messages. These messages are immutable. You can't change uh, them when you have added um, content to it. And then here you have your mailbox and you get incoming messages and they are processed one after the other. So here again, you don't have to care about um, the logs and so on. And so it's um, much easier in several use cases, um, for, but you have to be able to split your problem into several different parts. If this is, a, uh, is possible, then actors are a much better uh, solution than using the thread API. So for example, we use actors in um, telecommunication systems where we have millions of messages, and that's exactly the model here. And in many use cases, you can use it. 
And then you don't have to care about the thread API and can use these actors instead. And these actors are also, again, integrated into many modern new languages. For example, here is um, Scala, as you can see. You define an actor, and depending on the message where it arrives, um, it does something here. And then you can send messages asynchronously to this actor. This is just a little example here. Um, but you can see um, you don't use the thread API logs or synchronization or such stuff. And so you lower the thread to deadlocks and race conditions. You still um, need some of these best practices. Um, you can also have deadlocks, but it's um, um, much less than with thread API. And here's another example in Groovy. Um, here's an example of the um, GPAS, Groovy Parallel Systems. Here you can see um, there they gave the actors an OO facade. So here you can still write um, simple methods and just use an annotation to say, hey, this method should be created as an actor. So um, the GPAS library does it implicitly. You don't have to create these actors. This is probably a bit easier to learn at the beginning. So um, another example for reduced complexity is domain-specific languages. Um, Domain-specific languages are used um, so that people can understand them easily, also if they are no programming experts, at least in theory. Um, in practice, probably only real developers use it, but also for them it's easier to use them instead of um, other code with it, which is not a domain-specific language. Um, we have used um, these DSLs, especially in test frameworks. Um, there are many test frameworks available. And I will show you one example here again, just that you can see the difference. Um, and here's um, Scala test. It's a test framework for Scala. And if you uh, look at the code, um, here's first a simple example of Java. So if you do an assertion uh, and look at the map, and if it contains a key. And for example, here in Scala, um, it's more like a real language. So it is much easier to read and to understand and to write. This is only a simple example. Um, especially also in test frameworks, and um, there are complex examples um, where it really makes sense and helps you a lot to reach the complexity of your code. And you can create such a code with Java. You can create only it only with modern languages such as Scala and others. Here's a more powerful example. I really like that one. You can look at the um, blog later if you want. Um, it's the basic DSL, and it simulates basic in Scala. So as you can see here, this is Scala code. But what you really write in this DSL is basic, right? This old, um, ugly language basic. And here you can see how powerful um, these DSLs are and what you can create with it. So if you have any business problem with, which have um, specific names and so on, you can create a domain-specific language for it. And then it's much easier and reduces the complexity of your code a lot. You have to create your DSL just once, and then you can use it, and all your developers can use it. So the fourth example for um, business value added through new languages, reduced heterogeneity. So this is how it usually works in our projects. Um, we have source code, for example, in Java. We have um, in style scripts, um, which are used via shell or anything else. Um, use dynamic database scripts via JRuby or any other language. And then you have to build with R or Maven XML. And so you have many different languages which you have to learn. And what we try to do, it's not always working, of course, but what we try to do, we use um, as few languages as possible. So you can do all of this, for example, in Groovy. We uh, like to use Groovy for build, for example, and then we also use it for install scripts because Groovy is, can also be used for scripting. And why not use Groovy for these scripts too? So then you have all of your code in one language. It's much, much easier to maintain it if it's all the same language. Um, if you write some source code for your business logic, and then you look at your build, and you have to change something, it's much easier for every of your developers um, if it's the same language. And the fifth business value is um, innovation. What do I mean with this? So um, of course, when you start with new languages, you have to learn them at the beginning. And then you have to learn new technologies, new concepts, new solutions. And 
one great thing is, of course, you can do marketing. You can um, write articles and blogs and go to conferences with it. And in the end, you often also get new projects. Um, you can consult other companies, you can do coaching and development. And besides this, um, for innovation, you can also use um, these concepts and so on in your old language, right? So, for example, I have never um, used stuff like immutability in Java code. Before, I um, started with Scala and so on, and there I think about, hey, right, I use immutability and it makes sense in many use cases, so why don't, shouldn't I use it in um, my Java code too where it makes sense? So this is another huge benefit in my opinion. And another opinion, of course, um, innovation of using new languages. Um, all of you know the War of Talents. All need new de developers. Um, and what here, young developers, especially in Germany, probably it's the same in, same in the United States, follow the leader. So this uh, should mean, hey, cool, this enterprise user is Groovy in Scala. I don't have to use Java, this ugly code. It's boring and so on. And if you say in your, in your recruiting uh, to the people, um, hey, you can use Scala and Groovy on your projects, then um, they will really like it, usually. Though this is another thing, not, you should not underestimate this power of um, using new languages. Okay, so the conclusion about business value. Um, I think the new languages can create a lot of new business value to your projects. You can reduce efforts, as we have seen, um, reduce the complexity. You can get better flexibility and reduce the heterogeneity. Um, but also important here again, um, use it where it makes sense. As I've shown you some examples, um, there you can really add value with it. So in the end, it's in my opinion or in the opinion of our company, it's a success to use these languages. And um, now we come to the but part. Of course, we have several lessons learned here when we use these languages. And that's what I want to talk next. So first about language selection. As I've shown you here, uh, 250 languages for the Java platform. Um, probably only 10 or 12 or so should really be used. But the question is which one to use. First again, a short excursus. Um, I have talked about these um, concepts before. Statically typed language versus dynamically typed language. Uh, in my opinion, the statically typed language uh, has less power because you don't have stuff like metaprogramming and scripting and it's not that easy to use this uh, power. And, but therefore, the dynamically typed languages are more complex because you can easily write code which no one understands. If you have seen the examples with the metaprogramming, if you write some metaprogramming, another developer doesn't know what happens here. And if you have a static language like Scala or Java, you get errors in your IDE. You doesn't, don't get errors in your IDE with um, dynamically typed language. There, everything is runtime exception usually. And the second uh, important difference is programming concepts. So Java is object-oriented, not 100% because of prim uh, primitives and so on, but usually it's object-oriented. And in new modern GVM languages, you also have to use functional programming often. Um, a huge difference here, for example, is you have, to use, uh, you have different side effects. So you use immutability and such stuff. You uh, use recursion and so on. And it, of course, depends on how old you are, because um, if you have studied 20 years ago, you probably has, have learned all of these concepts. Um, I have studied about um, five years ago, and I have not really learned about these concepts here, like recursion and so on. And so it's really tough for me to use these functional concepts now. But with um, languages like Clojure, these are fully functional, and also other languages like Scala, they use object-oriented concepts, but also functional concepts. And the great thing here is because um, these deferred side effects and so on <coughs> is much better for scalability and um, multi-core CPUs and so on. So probably we will see much more of these concepts in the future in the using languages. Okay, so the question now is which languages shall we use? And this here again is the experience of our company and what we used um, for our clients and what we will use in the future. So, in our opinion, if you use another language besides, Scala, uh, besides Java, it has to be Java friendly because all or most of our developers are Java developers and so you should easily learn the new language and it must be feature rich because if the new language doesn't create any added value, we don't uh, have to use it, it doesn't make any sense. 
So these are the two requirements um, which we had to choose our languages besides Java. And as you can see again, there are several languages, so which to use. Um, one important thing here is the maturity of the languages. So um, we only use, of course I use um, languages for fun sometimes to check out new concepts or so, but we're really talking here about um, languages in production, which we use in our projects in production. And if we uh, go to production, we can't use languages like Kotlin or Phantom or um, Ceylon because they are not ready yet. They cannot uh, or should not be used, in my opinion, in projects which go to production in the next six months. So these can be excluded easily, uh, no matter which um, added value they add because they are not ready for production now at the moment. And the next thing is prevalence. So how many people do use this language? Is there a community? Can you discuss with other people? Are there blogs? Are there books? Um, can you go to conferences and talk about these languages a lot with other people who have experiences about that? And if you look again at the remaining languages, um, we in our company don't use Clojure or Erlang, which is based on Erlang, um, because it may be great languages and it also have great concepts for some problems, but um, almost no one uses it, and so in our company it doesn't make any sense. And so there are only still le some left. And now the next important thing is platform integration. So again, we are all Java developers, we want to combine these languages with Java. And first, if you look at the syntax alignment, so here's a little example with Java code, and then we see Groovy code, which is probably easy to use. We see Scala code, which is a little bit another code, but it's also okay. And then if you see, for example, Ruby, it's a more different, and or Python, they look different than Groovy or Java. And of course, if you use Clojure, then it's a really another kind of language, so probably your IDE needs a parenthesis generator to use um, Clojure, but um, as you can see, it's um, really another syntax than Java. So these ones are, in our opinion, red, so um, the syntax alignment is bad, so it's not good for, to learn for Java developers. And now we will see the two of our favorites, which we use in our company. The first one is Groovy. And now let's talk about seamless integration. Here you see the example, as I mentioned at the beginning. Um, yes, you don't have to um, write your constructor, and you don't have to write getters and setters, so it's easy to learn. But um, what's even more impressive, in my opinion, is this. So this is also Groovy code, right? And as you can see, there's no difference from the Java code to the Groovy code. So if you begin as Java developer and start programming Groovy, you can still write Java code. And that really works for about 95% of your Groovy code. And so it's really easy to learn as Java developer to write Groovy. And this is one of the most benefits. Yes, you can use all of these features later. You don't have to write um, semicolons and constructors and so on. But you can start with um, Java code and write Groovy code. And that's really awesome for seamless integration. So Groovy definitely is green. Um, seamless integration with, with Java is perfect. And the second language um, we use is Scala. And Scala is not that seamless integration because um, it has um, some features which create bytecode which does not fit perfectly to Java bytecode, um, like inexpressible language features, features and um, if you want to do Java bytecode analysis with any tools, it's much more difficult and not supported by many tools. But um, there's also a workaround here. Um, in most cases it works, and if it does not work, then you can just create a Java interface <coughs> if you want to integrate Java code with Scala code. So it's not as seamless as Groovy, but it's um, also okay. So you can combine it, and it works in most use cases. So as you can see here, um, these are the two languages which we use in our project besides Java. And why? Again here, because the languages have to be Java friendly. Yeah, this is Java friendly and this is also Java friendly. Not as good as Groovy, but it is okay. And it is feature rich. And here's also um, the reason why we use both of these and not this one and another one. With Groovy, we have the dynamic one. So we can use meta programming and scripting and that stuff. And we have Scala, we have the functional one. So here you can use uh, stuff for example actors and so on and um, without side effects and so on. So this is a perfect match in our opinion to use exactly these two 
besides Java, uh, besides Java, because with Java and these two languages, we can use um, all concepts we need in our projects. And what you also can see here, Java is still the most important language for us. So also in the future, we still use 90% uh, Java. And only where it really adds benefit, there we use Groovy or Scala. But in most use cases, or in most parts of our projects, we use Java. You can use Groovy or Scala for some code of your project. You don't have to switch all of your code to Scala or Groovy. So for example, Groovy for XML processing or so. So this is really the best combination. And this will be our solution for the next probably five years or so. Okay, so this was the explanation which languages we use in our company for our customers. And of course, there are several prob problems too. Um, the first one is a political one. So um, every customer asks why use new languages, Java does the job, right? So um, that's definitely true. So you, um, so you have um, to explain why you add these languages, why they add value. And as I have shown you in several examples before, how you can add business value, um, if you argument with this style, um, it usually works. Because in the end, um, the customer has to pay you hours, and, and, and um, so it works for him then too. And another problem, it's also political, is um, cloud computing is requested by the customer because it's a real hype. And NoSQL is requested by the customer because it's often necessary, because you need it for big data and high scalability. Um, but modern GVM languages, um, I've never seen a customer um, who requires it. Um, usually you have to make the step and say, hey, we want to use it because we can add value in any form. And besides these political problems, there are also um, real life problems for the developer. And these are the main problems which we had in our projects. Um, yeah, there are really new concepts um, for Java and OO developers. As I've mentioned, um, meta programming, actors, immutability, and so on. So you definitely have to read some books and learn about what you're doing before you do it. And also because these languages are really powerful and sometimes they're not that easy to use and you can do a lot wrong if you um, just use this, all the power of the language without any sense. So probably um, if you introduce Groovy into your project, every developer thinks, hey, cool features, I want to use them, I want to use meta programming and so on. And if you, every uh, of your developers uses meta programming, then uh, the maintaining your project will be a horror. So um, you can get a lot of confusion to the meta programming and really use it wisely. Uh, the next problem I've already mentioned, bytecode is not the same as bytecode. Um, and you also will get a problem with, for example, debugging because it's not that good supported by Groovy or Scala as it is with Java. And you have definitely took a look at the, um, take a look at the total cost of ownership. So you need skills, you need training, you need um, refactoring and maintenance. So um, at the beginning, it can be a huge invest, in, invest to um, use other languages besides Java. But there's another thing, um, and so this is also really a key message, don't let yourself be fooled. Um, because usually no customer cries if you use a checks compiler, or if you use a quit compiler for your web framework, or if you use a whistle compiler for your SOAP web services, right? So you have to learn this stuff also. If you use new concepts, you have to learn them. And using a new language is also adding just one or two libraries to your project, and that's it. And believe me, learning Groovy is easier than learning whistle or quit. So this can't be the problem, in my opinion. And here's one last example about the bytecode. So as you have seen before, um, Java and Groovy is good. Java and Scala is OK. And if you use non-Java and non-Java, it becomes much more difficult. So here's just one example for this. Um, it's a really great blog. Um, you should really read this blog post if you are interested. Um, here someone tried to combine Scala with Ruby. And you get much more problems with this because all create different bytecode. And for example, Scala uses the plus operator as method. And the bytecode which is generated is this one. It's a dollar sign with plus. But the dollar sign is an illegal character in Ruby. So you have to find a workaround to call it in Ruby. And so you see, it's not that easy to use all of these GVM languages one with each other. Um, sometimes you have to use workarounds. But these workarounds are also available if you Google for them, so it's no showstopper, usually. And the last problem, of course, um, the IDEs are not as good as they are with Java. No matter if you use Eclipse or NetBeans or IntelliJ, 
um, support becomes better and better for the new languages and there are many changes ahead, but um, the support for Java is much better, definitely. So um, be aware of this. And um, also you have to evaluate which um, IDE is good for your language which you use. For most modern new languages, um, we use IntelliJ because it has the best support in my opinion. But for example, since um, TypeSafe started um, creating the Scala plugin for Eclipse, this will also become better and better. So um, you have to evaluate, evaluate it over time. Okay, this was the problems which we had when using these languages. And the last thing is how to get started. So um, not everybody which I talk to is um, aware yet that you can make something out of nothing. You have to do some initial work. You have to, have to learn these new languages, right? Invest some time, buy yourself a book and start with it. And when you start with it, that's the next important lesson learned from ourselves. Um, buy the right book. Don't buy a book um, which is a thousand pages and explains you every feature of Scala or Groovy. Buy a book which is from the view of a Java developer. For example, here making Java Groovy or functional programming with Scala. These books start from the view of a Java developer and explain you the features of, for example, Groovy or Scala from the perspective of a Java developer. So you can easily learn the new features and they also um, explain you why and when you should use these features. So several examples of my talk today were from these books. And then you of course have to use these new languages, um, look back at your finished projects and look at the benefits which I told you at the beginning of the session. Maybe think about it when should you use another language um, and think about it before starting the new projects, not in the middle of projects. That also happened at our customer. Um, and use it um, for marketing channels, write an article, play around with it, um, go to a conference, use it for testing, and then first start some internal projects. Our first projects with Scala and Groovy were internal projects because they are um, not that important and so you can not do that much wrong as with your customer. And then when you are ready, then you can start it with your projects. And so, um, conclusion lessons learned, it's really a fun house, it's a lot of fun, but you can also have some problems with it, which you have to solve. And so finally, um, I hope you did get the key messages. Let's recap that again. Um, in our opinion, Java is still the most important programming platform. And it's not a new COBOL, also the Java languages get new features all the time. But um, modern GVM languages, besides Java, not instead of Java, create added value and choose wisely when to use which of them and be aware that you don't have to use a new language for all of your project but you can use it just for some parts of your project too. For example, XML processing is the best example for using another language. So I hope you can make a cross on yes, you get the key messages and so finally let's get started with the new languages and thank you a lot. <laughs>